Okay, so my name is Jane Eliasoff. I'm the director of the Montclair History Center. We've been doing these programs now since April. Can't believe we're coming up on a year and we're still in our houses, but um, here we are. We do them every other week. And if you've missed any of them, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Um, the YouTube channel, just go to YouTube, type in Montclair History Center and you'll see them. They're probably about 22 or 24 up there already. Um, because they do go up on YouTube, if you are um, hesitant to have your face or your name up there, make sure you either stop your video or hide your name or, or something like that. You can choose an alias. The more creative, the more we enjoy them. Um, and so uh, we hope that you enjoy today's program. Um, we have been offering these programs free of charge, but you know uh, by now that if you would like to make a donation, there are many ways you can do so. You can send a check to us at 108 Orange Road in Montclair, 07042. You can do it on our website. Um, we also take Venmo, just put in Montclair History Center, and we take Zella so, or Zell. So you can do it any of those ways. If there's an opportunity for you to type in there that it's because of these History at Home programs, please do that. We, we love to know where uh, the donations are coming from. So with that, I think I'm gonna start. Um, Helen and I have been sort of toying with this program. Uh, Helen Fallon is a member of our board. We've been toying with this program now for um, several months. And um, we decided that we were going to try doing it because Muckler has just got so many great, great buildings. And so I'm going to let Helen tell you a little bit more about why we uh, came up with this idea and she will launch the program. So if I'm just going to share my screen. All right. While you're doing that, I will launch in here. So um, Jane and I are both history and architecture fans, like I'm sure many of you. And Montclair, like other railroad suburbs developed in the late 1800s, the early 1900s, is a great place to indulge both of those interests. We have a rich inventory of residential architectural styles. We have structures dating back to the 1700s. We have mill worker homes and farmhouses, estates of the Gilded Age, then to the building boom years of the early 20th century and more recent contemporary additions. So we hope that this show, which could just as have easily have been titled A Celebration of Architecture in Montclair, prompts you to walk around, drive around, look closely at houses all over town because there are literally gems in every neighborhood. Jane and I, um, so, you know, knock on wood, we managed to not get into any fender benders um, or get arrested while we were looking around and taking pictures, but it's, it's worth a good look. It was close. <laughs> <laughs> Next oh. slide, Jane. Yep, okay. Um, neither Jane nor I are architects, but we have studied up. And we've consulted architects and other design professionals like our um, fellow um, MS, M. Montclair History Center trustee, Betsy Cecchio, and also preservation architects, preservation architect, Deborah David, and other architects. We've also researched the preservation Montclair inventory that was commissioned by the Junior League some years ago. A Field Guide to American Houses has sort of been our Bible, and many other architectural books and sources too. Uh, what we can tell you is that defining architectural styles is not always an exact science. First of all, professionals differ on how details and structures could or should be interpreted. And secondly, we have something here called the Montclair Mishmash, which we'll explain. So our intent is to give you a sense of what the major styles we see in town are and what some of their defining shapes or details are. And we hope that you enjoy the eye candy that we've assembled today. So we're gonna start with um, a visual glossary of some terms that will come up frequently. Um, on this blue house, you see the dental molding, which is like little teeth along the top under the roof. Um, we sometimes um, will refer to six over six windows or um, eight over one. The top number is how many windows are on the top of a do double hung window and the bottom number is how many are on the bottom of that window. So like my house is six over one, the one in this picture is six over six. Um, often a Queen Anne will be one over one. Also here, you can see the pediment, which is the pointy little roof over the door. Next slide, okay. This, there's more terms here. They're pretty self-explanatory on this um, illustration. And I just want to point out that a tower extends from the ground up, like on the left, whereas a turret, which is on the right, um, you know, doesn't, uh, that one doesn't start until uh, the second floor. 
this little house has a lot of other um, glossary terms that are helpful to know. Um, let's see. So we've got the cornice, which is that band that runs underneath the roof. The eave is that um, what sticks out over the house. It's what keeps the rain off you um, from the roof. And um, we have brackets on this one that you can see those decorative brackets. And we have the fan light, which is a um, small semicircular or rectangular window above the front door and the side lights, which are narrow windows on either side of the front door. Now, personally, I grappled with some terms describing roof lines. So I used a field guide to American houses to draw this compilation. And the terms like side gable, front gable, center gabled are pretty straightforward. Um, but then there were some other terms like, for example, mansard, um, which is, is a very tall roof that often flips out at the edges or gambrel, which is, um, you know, so I think of it as a <laughs> roof, um, which is um, you see in a lot of Dutch inspired architecture. But my favorite for sure is, um, is the clipped gable um, where the peak of the point is sort of squished back and it's less commonly called a jerkin head, but I love to call it a jerkin head. And I drive through town saying jerkin head, jerkin head, jerkin head, because we have tons of them in Montclair. Uh, the shape actually has a functional advantage over traditional gables from what I read, but we're not getting into any of that technical stuff. Um, it's a, but we will refer to roof lines sometimes in our discussion. Now, we also wanted to de define the term vernacular, which confounded me for a little bit of time. And now I understand Jane found this nice definition. Common domestic architecture of a region, usually far simpler than what the technology of the time is capable of maintaining. Vernacular structures are characterized by inexpensive materials and straightforwardly utilitarian in design. Um, so it's sort of an everyday house built in the materials readily available and in the style of the time. It's what all the kids are wearing, maybe not the super duper cool kids, but the regular kids. Um, I've also seen it described as architecture without architects. So in some places of the world, vernacular architecture might look like this or like this. Um, and in Montclair over the years, it has looked like different things. Um, th these houses on Miller Street were built for factory workers in the 1800s. And um, in the next picture, you'll see some more recently renovated homes on Grove Street. And then there's also this really sweet little house in, um, from Frog Hollow that is really quite old. As you drive through Montclair, you see many architectural styles, but there are few pure examples of a particular style. If you were wealthy enough to hire an architect in the 1880s, you might start with a basic house. But then your wife tells you how much she loves Queen Anne turrets and you want light in your hallways. So you add a federal style fan light, which of course looks so much better with Georgian columns. And oh yeah, you've always admired that Gothic window at church. So what started out as one style now is a mishmash. The result can be lovely and interesting, but it's a bit more mishmash than true period piece. So the way we're going to structure this is we'll show you an iconic example of that form of architecture, maybe in Montclair, maybe not. And you'll always be able to recognize our iconic example because of this subtle little banner across the bottom that says great example. We'll talk about some of the defining features of that style, then look at some of the Montclair houses that have that style. Um, note, for the most part, we've stuck with residential, not commercial architecture, although I admit a couple of them have snuck in. Um, and as Helen said before, different websites and different books have different features for the same style. So we did stick with that one, The Field Guide to American Houses by Virginia and Lee McAllister. Um, so since Montclair was settled in the late 1600s, let's start there. As you may remember, we had Dutch and English settlers here in Montclair. The Dutch settled north of Wachong and the English settled to the south. Now there was a high style of architecture during the 1700s. It was called Georgian, but you really don't see any true Georgians in Montclair. The architecture for us during the 1700s was period vernacular. The homes built by the Dutch and English settlers were based on their traditions of their family, their homelands and their friends. Um, and it really was not led by famous architects in any way. So our first great example is close by, not quite in Montclair, but close. It's the Hamilton von Wagner House in Clifton. And it's a typical Dutch colonial. 
uh, built by the early Dutch settlers. This land had actually been in that family since seven, 1679 when the uh, Quackenock patent was signed. Uh, but the stone part of this house uh, was built around 1815. And it's got some pretty classic Dutch figures. It's usually one and a half stories high. It has a side or gambrel roof. I like to call it a barn roof as opposed to what Helen calls it. Um, it has a minimal side overhang. Um, and then you often would see these Dutch or divided doors. I can't tell whether this house has one or had one when it was first built. Um, it's also stone. And while not all Dutch colonials are made out of stone in this part of New Jersey, that's what we see most frequently. <clears throat> and it's usually local Jersey brownstone. Now here's another picture of that same building, but I love the angle because you really get a good shot of that gambrel roof. Um, and very often, and I don't know if this was the case in this house, but that small wing was built first. And as time and money allowed, they built a larger house right adjacent to it and then connected the two using that first house as either a um, kitchen wing or a small bedroom or sometimes for the retired parents. So way back when, when I was in high school, I was part of an archeological dig on the Dutch Campbell Christie house that's now part of Newbridge Landing in Hackensack. And it was before they moved it from its location in New Milford. And we were actually able to deduce from the artifacts that we pulled up from the ground that indeed that older wing or the smaller wing was the older wing. So now that was Dutch. Let's take a quick look at some English and how it differed. Um, notice, first of all, that it's frame and not stone. This is the Nathaniel Crane House, which was built in 1818. You may not recognize it, but it's the red building that's located at the rear of our property um, at 108 Orange Road. Um, it used to sit where the Mark Lay History Center's administrative offices now sit, um, the Clark House today. But back in the 1890s, when Dr. Clark wanted to build his new fancy schmancy home, he had to do something with this one. So he, instead of demolishing it, he rolled it to the back of his property uses, using horses and logs. Uh, but before doing that, he actually demolished that small wing. So we don't know whether it was older or whether um, um, it was part of the original house, but notice there's no front door on here. So it must have either been part of the original house or preceded um, the house. So let's look at some of the traditional features. You have the steep pitched roof with the side gable. Um, you have these little small uh, windows that my father always called lie on your tummy windows. Um, and then the chimneys are usually on the side and they're pretty massive. Now this is the back of the house and you can see it mirrors the front of the house. That single chimney up here actually went down through the house and then divided into two fireplaces. And it gives us a hint um, that uh, there were probably two rooms on this first floor. And that was a very common layout for modest homes during that uh, period. And here's just a different view that shows you um, from the front angle, those two fireplaces. Now this one is on Wachung Avenue. Um, and although you can't see it from the road today, that vegetable garden has been replaced by this absolutely beautiful little secret garden. Um, it was part of our Harvest Home Tour last, last year, and I was really excited to be able to, to actually get in the house. It may have been built around 1740. Uh, we're not positive on the date, but the picture was taken about 1860, so it was actually 120 years old. Um, I love the picture of the people sitting up there. It was built by Dutch settlers. Um, notice um, how the stone on it. Um, another Dutch one, and I know we have the current owners of the house mm. on the call today. This is the Egbert Farm, built in the 1780s. It too was built by the uh, early Dutch settlers, and it's located on North Mountain. And I know we're zipping through all these old houses, and they're fascinating, but um, Helen and I are going to do a separate, or Mike and Helen and I, we haven't figured it out yet, are going to do a separate presentation on just the older homes in Montclair because there are so many great ones with such great rich history. Um, this house is on Union Street. It was part of the original crane land at the foot of the mountain. It was built either around 1740 or 1790. It was probably, it was English. You can tell that because of the side gable, the large chimneys and the steep roof. What I love is their nearest neighbor was probably Nathaniel Crane who lived right around the corner from him. And 
You may not recognize this house today, but when I show you the other side, you probably will. Uh, the family decided to update it with this beautiful wide veranda. Um, and when you compare the two of them side by side, you really uh, get a sense that they're almost two different houses. You'd never know they're the same. And this is the James Howe House on Claremont Avenue. Um, you may know it as the Freed Slave Home, and that's another story for another day. Um, notice it has this, many of the hallmarks of that early English vernacular. We have the side gable, that steep pitched roof, the large chimney, the small windows. Um, and that is sort of a quick look at some of the, a few of the very many early vernacular homes we have here in Montclair. I'm gonna go back to high style now, and that's the federal style that was popular from about 1776 to 1820. Um, although Montclair has plenty of federal revivals, we don't have any very many true federals dating back from 1776 to 1820. It draw, uh, the style drew heavily on a style by the Adams brothers who were architectural firm in Britain. Um, so you may see the same style referred to as Adam or Adamesque but we had just fought a war with the Brits and we weren't about to admit that we were emulating their architecture. So we just called it something else. We called it the federal period instead. So let's look at the features. Um, we have that side gable. It's usually a simple box with two rooms deep. It has that side gable that the arrow's pointing to, but you sometimes see other um, styles as well. It's usually symmetrical, um, although there may have been a small wing off to one side or another. The front door was often accentuated by a pediment, all this, this one is not, um, but it may have been one of three styles, either pointed, curved, or broken. That really wasn't broken, that was the way it was done. Um, there were usually fan lights over the doors to let light into that center hallway. And it usually had five bays. Now, architecturally speaking, a bay is everything that's covered in that one shaded area around number five. So this would have had five bays, typical of a federal style home. It usually had double hung windows and also a uh, raised foundation. So where would there be a federal style home in Montclair that was from this period? We looked hard and couldn't find one, but we did find this one in Bloomfield. Um, it's the Presbyterian Manse. Uh, it was built in 1796. And notice all of those hallmarks that I had spoken to you about before. Now, the reason I really wanted to include this is because I believe this is what the Montclair History Center's Crane House and Historic YWCA looked like when Israel Crane built it. I've gone into the attic of the Crane House and sure enough, you see the ghosts of this roof line there. Um, it was built in the same year, 1796. It has many of the same features inside, especially on uh, like some of the decorative features like the fireplace mantles. Um, and Israel was also a prominent member of that church. But we know it doesn't look like that today. We'll get to that. The federal style was popular until about 1820 when the Greek revival style came into vogue. And when we think of Greek revival, this is often what comes to mind. I bet you can guess what day I was doing this. Mm -hmm. um, you can easily imagine the connection to the Greek temple. It has these large columns, um, the triangular pediment. It has uh, the doors with fan lights and side lights. It has this wide cornice across the, underneath the pediment. You don't notice the chimneys because they're, they sort of fade away and there's definitely symmetry with it. Um, but you can see how it translates into more uh, commonplace vernacular architecture. This one happens to be in Glastonbury, Connecticut. And what's interesting is that in this area of Connecticut, you find so many Greek revival houses, especially along the rivers. And that's because the towns came to be during the Industrial Revolution, when people were using that water power. Um, and so uh, that the Industrial Revolution coincides with those great periods of growth around these towns and also coincides with this period of architecture. And as you'll hear over and over today, the architectural styles that dominate the community often echo during the peri periods of greatest growth. Greek Revival doesn't always look like that. Sometimes it looks like this. Now the roof is flat, often with this parapet on top. 
It has the wide cornice. The front has these modest little one-story columns, but lo and behold, those grand two-story columns are in the back. And there's still a connection to Greek temples, but it's a whole different sort of look. Um, so those are the high style homes, but they still play out vernacularly like this one. Now you often have to play detective when you're doing this, okay? And look behind the siding and the Queen Anne style additions to find it, but I think we did here. So this house was built in 1830, so it's the right time period. Now subtract the tower and subtract the bay window that were probably Queen Anne additions. And you can make out that front gable here in front, which definitely shows the Greek Revival influence. And similarly, this cute little house on Cross Street was recently renovated. It was built between 1830 and 1840, and it too has that front gable. Now think back to all those vernacular homes we looked at. I didn't choose them specifically, but none of them had front gables. They all had side gables or gambrel uh, uh, gables. So according to the Field Guide to American Houses, one of the most important and enduring legacies of the Greek Revival style to American domestic architecture is this front gable. Um, and we still see them being built today. The Greek Revival has a decade um, endured, uh, style has endured ever since. Um, this is a house on Grove Street, probably built a little bit later based on some of the other um, aspects of it, some of the other features in it. Um, but it has that front gable with shades of Greek Revival. And notice this, you often find these little details on the front gable homes. Um, and that's sort of to accentuate that front pediment, even though if it, it's not um, a completely separated pediment. Now, here is um, that house that we were talking about before, the Presbyterian Manse um, in Bloomfield. Uh, and in the 1840s, at the height of Greek revivalism, Israel Crane moved out to an apartment in, or to a house in um, Newark, and left the house in his son James' care, and James and his wife Phoebe moved in, and they decided they had to have the house much more modern than it was back here, so he turned it into a Greek revival. Notice the columns, notice the portico, notice the flat roof, notice the wide cornice band, but even behind it, side by side, when you look at them, there's still that five bay symmetry. The chimneys are on the side, left over from the federal days. They're just obscured a little bit. So up until now, there's been a linear progression. We've gone from Georgian, although we didn't talk much about it, then to federal, and then to Greek revival. And now it's when things go a bit crazy. Welcome to the Victorian age. This is Queen Victoria herself. She reigned from 1837 to 1900 when she passed away. And technically any house that was built during this period qualifies as Victorian. But Victorian really is a misnomer because there are so many, many, many styles that were popular during her reign. So calling a house a Victorian house is like calling a dog a dog and not differentiating between whether it's a German Shepherd or a Chihuahua. So we're gonna go into the Chihuahuas and German Shepherds in this, in this program. Um, you'll see all of the styles uh, that came about during Queen Victoria's reign. This list is incomprehensive. It's the ones we see most often around Montclair. Um, and over the course of the next two programs, we're gonna go through each one of these, talking about their key features and showing you some examples in Montclair. Now notice how they overlap. And like in the case of Queen Anne and Shingle, they actually are happening simultaneously. Um, that's how we get the Montclair mishmash very often. Um, you will find especially a lot of shingle style homes that have Queen Anne um, touches to them. And it sometimes it's very hard to distinguish the two of them. Notice also they span a whole period of time. For example, Gothic Revival picks up where Greek Revival left off, but it continues, according to American, the field guide, it continues about uh, until the end of the 1880s. But that said, Helen is gonna talk about one church that was still not completed until the middle of the 20th century. And so these are sort of when the styles were at their height, but not necessarily the only time you'll find a house from that period. And with that as a teaser, Helen, I'm turning it over to you. Okay. 
Well, as Jane's chart indicates, Gothic Revival in general was popular um, from 1840 to 1880. Uh, we often see the style in ecclesiastical or church architecture. So um, it has the steeped pitch roof, pointed arches, foils, square towers. This cathedral basilica of, this, of the Sacred Heart in Newark is a really magnificent example, right? Not far from us. Um, so it has all of those things that I mentioned. Uh, this style is also seen in St. John the Divine and St. Patrick's Cathedral. And note that Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris was an original Gothic church, the look upon which these revivals are based. This is a great residential example of Gothic revival on Valley Road. It's got the steep pitched roof, tall slim chimneys, exposed rafters um, under the eaves there, the windows extend into the gables, and it even has a little castellation, those little marks over the door, like a little castle. And look, it's got a jerkin head there on the left, bonus. <laughs> the Gothic Revival style is still discernible in Martin's funeral home on Elm Street. It's got the steep pitched roof and decorated verge board, which is that decoration that runs up and down um, the, the gable there. But if you look at this, this original photo of the home, when Julius Pratt built it in 1857, it's even easier to see. Here you can still see the little drip molds over the windows um, that have since been removed. They look like little check marks that are on either side of the window and they were there to direct water away from the window. This is the church that Jane was referring to. Um, the First Congregational Church on South Fullerton Avenue is um, a little less obvious example, but still uh, classified as Gothic Revival. And it replaced an earlier church that had burned on the site in 1914. The earlier version was very pointy Gothic Revival. So we're looking at the, the version that was built in 1920 by acclaimed architect, Bertram Goodhue, and the grounds were designed by the Olmsted firm. So this was built in 1920, which is outside the primary time frame of Gothic Revival, but it's got the pointed arch doors, it's got the square tower with a parapet a wall on top, and it's got foils. Um, and I wonder if they were clinging to some of the Gothic Revival style, because that's what the old church that had burned was so strongly designed in, and maybe it was familiar to them. I have no idea. That's just my guess. I, Helen, also point out the National Register symbol. Oh, yeah. So when you see that symbol down in the lower left, it means that structure's on the National Register. The structure we see in the background of this painting, American Gothic, transitions us to the Carpenter Gothic style. It was popular for the same time period as Gothic Revival, primarily from 1840 to 1880. There's lots of similarities to Gothic Revival, steep roof lines, pointed arches mainly, but it was more likely to be made of wood, very often with added vertical board and batten siding that reinforced the verticality of the structures. You see those lines, um, those vertical lines in the painting that Jane's pointing to. This Llewellyn Roadhouse has some great Carpenter Gothic features, including the full width porch, pointed arches, steep roof, um, windows that extend into the gable, interestingly decorated verge boards. Here's another great pointy Carpenter Gothic example on Elm Street near Lincoln. Um, and this one, you can see the, uh, the bracketry, uh, exposed bracketry under the eaves there. And so now we're going to turn to Italianate. It was the dominant style of architecture uh, between 1840 and 1885. Montclair is no exception. Um, like the classical styles that came before it, it was modeled on the old world. But instead of that formality of a Greek temple, this was more like a sprawling Italian villa or farmhouse. As you drive around town, you'll see lots of simple homes that have Italianate features. Um, and that is because this is obviously the period after the railroads came through and there was an awful lot of building going on in town. Um, so the houses are usually asymmetrical. <clears throat> they have this low pitched roof with wide eaves and brackets. One of the telltale signs though is these rounded windows that you see that are often in pairs or triplets, although not here. Um, they're often one over one. Again, they're not here, they're two over two. Um, and porches are pretty common. 
And the house doesn't have a paired doorway, a tower or cupola, but that's something you might find as well. And bay windows are often common and here peeking out behind the bushes is a bay window. So let's take a look at how that plays out in Montclair. Um, this is around the corner from the Crane House on Union. According to Henry Riddemore's history book, this was built around 1871 by Israel Crane, who was our Israel Crane's grandson, and he's bought it, he built it specifically for rental purposes. It has that Greek Revival flat roof, um, the wide band near the cornice, um, but then you have these Italianate details that go along with it, like the wide eaves and the brackets. Um, these are much more simple, um, but nonetheless Italianate. Uh, they are two of the seven sisters on Chestnut between Park and Valley, built around 1875. Um, they're simplified Italianate. You see those windows. Um, the house on the left, they're actually one over one still. Uh, it's got the porch um, and it's really, it's fun to drive around, drive along Chestnut and see if you can count the seven sisters. But uh, take my advice, don't do it if there happens to be a car right behind you, they're not happy. Um, the, another Italianate on Lincoln Street, this one is simplified, but it has those rounded windows and it has not one, but three bay windows on its side. This one is at 40 Union. Um, it is built in 1875. It's actually Italianate, but it has the Carpenter Gothic um, board and batten on top. But see the rounded windows? When you're trying to figure out what a style, uh, what style a house is, look for the things that are hardest to change, like the windows. Um, that's what gave us the hint, and the paired doors here, and that's what gave us the hint that this is indeed um, Italianate. Now here's a fun story. We don't get much into social history of this, but I couldn't resist on this one. This home was owned by the Morgan family who moved from Montclair to Cedar Grove when the movie theaters arrived in Montclair. Um, they moved because they thought with the movie theaters coming to town, Montclair was going to hell in a handbasket. And so they built a home in Cedar Grove and that home is now the head of the Cedar Grove Historical Society. Um, a final Italian eight, uh, or not a final, another Italian eight. It's the Van Riper Bond House on the campus of Montclair State University, built in 1872. Arched windows, one over one, beautiful porch, bay window hidden by that tree. Uh, but notice it's symmetrical, not asymmetrical, which is one of the hallmarks of Italian eight style homes. Um, and it's actually got that Greek revival front gable with those extra little details on the side peeking through. This pretty one is on South Mountain. Uh, according to Eleanor Price from A Goodly Heritage, it's the only remaining one of several that were built around 1859 to accommodate all the people who are moving into town because of the railroads. Uh, notice the arched triple windows, that grand porch, the bay window on the left side, decorative brackets under the eaves. It's really, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful home. And it's been saved actually now because it has condos peeking out from behind it, which is a really nice example of adaptive reuse. Here's one of the few commercial buildings we tucked in here. Um, this is on the corner of South Fullerton and Bloomfield. It was the Crane Hardware Building, but notice the brackets and notice the windows with the rounded tops. Now this one is the one I'm gonna end the Italianate section on. It's Mr. Haskell's Bloomfield Villa on Llewellyn Road. Um, remember, Montclair was called Bloomfield during the period when um, this house was uh, under construction. So it was built by the famed Alexander Jackson Davis, um, the architect of Llewellyn Park. So Mr. Haskell was one of Mr. Davis's good buddies. He was a, also a business associate. He was a New York City drug importer. And guess what Mr. Haskell's first name was? Llewellyn. Who knew? I didn't. Davis started to build this house, but Haskell sold it before it was completed. The drawings, according to the Junior League survey, and I'd love to see them someday, um, show it as an Italianate, but it was extensively remodeled and added on to some af sometime after it was built. Um, however, if you look at the features of the house that are hardest to change, the windows, we see those Italianate rounded windows. There was also originally a balcony above here, so it would have gone like right along here with a balustrade. Um, and I don't know whether those stick style, uh, we'll get to stick style in a minute, but I don't know whether those this stick style uh, feature was added or whether it was actually part of the original design. But I wanna point out this little roof over here, see that? It almost looks like a satellite dish, but it's actually a roof. And I have to share this great picture with you. I think it's the turret 
that we see over here. Yeah, never mind that there's a cow in the front yard. We're not going to talk about that. Uh, but I'm going to zoom in because you really get a good sense of what this house uh, might have looked like when it was first built. Ah, Helen. Here we are. Welcome to the Second Empire. Um, with its most recognizable feature, the mansard roof. Um, ooh la la Paris. So the reason behind this very tall roof has something to do with a little bit of tax evasion. French buildings were taxed by the number of stories to the base of the roof. So they measured up to the cornice line, um, making any living space above uh, that, the roof, um, tax exempt. So it really is an entire floor that is tax exempt. In this case, it looks like they managed to get two floors um, above, the, above the roof line. So the, the most characteristic uh, design elements here are of course the molded mansard roof, uh, the elaborate dormer surrounds, they, um, and also dental molding. Second Empire style was popular for a very short time, just 30 years from 1855 to 1885 generally. Um, so, but so when you spot one, it's probably a very old structure. Jane has said that she notices that Montclair has so many more Second Empires, um, Second Empire homes than other New Jersey towns. Well, that seems to be correlated, as we've said, with the building boom and the money that came to town after the arrival of the railroads. The first railroad line um, came here in 1856, the second in 1873. And of course, those trains made daily commuting uh, from Montclair into New York possible and really were, um, you know, changed the look of Montclair. So there's some beautiful Second Empire examples here, including this one on Clinton Avenue. We see the molded cornice there um, along, the, um, along the roof line, um, decorative brackets under the eaves, elaborate dormer windows, uh, the square massing, and of course, the roof shape. This law firm on Claremont Street uh, Claremont Avenue has the roof line for sure. It also has a two-story bay window on the right side and um, a beautiful paint job that accentuates the cornice and the eaves. Um, I love this one. It's got great a great molded cornice, um, square massing. It's got that paired entry door that really pops in that color. And this one on Valley Road, I would have, I would imagine that this house on Valley near James at one time was the Grand Dame on a very large lot. Um, and now it's, it's nestled quite closely in with other modest sized lots on Valley Road, but there's that roof line. Um, this uh, one on South Mountain Avenue has the projecting central element here um, is has a very elaborate cornice and it has bay windows on either side. This one's a little different than the other ones we've seen because the roof line, um, although it's mansard, it's straighter than the other ones that had the little um, more of a, a swoop to them, more flared. The other ones were more flared. And then we'll finish up um, Second Empire with the, this little petite version, uh, which um, is on Park Street. It's a commercial space now, but it has, uh, you can see it has some really great bracketry and it's got the, the dormer windows and of course the flared tall roof, mansard roof. And that brings us to stick style, which was 1860 to about 1890. And this is the Chicka Macamico life-saving station in North Carolina. Um, Stick style is all about the decorative details, which actually almost create a textured look to the building. Um, it's all applied detail. It's not actually integral to the house itself. And it links the Gothic revival that Helen spoke about to the Queen Anne style, which Helen is about to speak about. Um, notice the pointed Gothic window. Typical features are a gable roof, the decorative trusses, the wide overhanging eaves um, and siding applied in every which direction possible, um, uh, vertical, horizontal, diagonal. And I don't know, I, I really love this style. I think it looks like a Victorian lady who's all gussied up for an evening. And um, I, there are no pure stick styles in Montclair, unfortunately, but you can kind of see how it's steeped into different houses. Um, this is that house that Alexander Jackson Davis designed on Llewellyn Road, and you can see that stick style up there. Um, this one's on Park Street. Uh, you can see the overhanging eaves with all of that fancy schmancy detailing. Um, 
emphasized in this case by the cool paint job. You might not even notice it otherwise. Uh, but look, instead of the Gothic pointed windows, we have the rounded Italianate windows. And this is the Swedish Lutheran Church on Glen Ridge Avenue that's seen better days today. Um, this photo was taken in the 1930s. It was built in 1896. Note the gabled roof, the decorative trusses, um, the porch supports, uh, the wooden cladding. Couldn't, couldn't you just imagine with all of that um, extra applied detail to it, it would just be darling. Um, wouldn't it be great if it looked like this today? So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Helen to talk about a different gussied up lady, and that's the Queen Anne. All right. Um, so Queen Anne, there's so much to see on a Queen Anne, uh, which was a new and popular style in Montclair and elsewhere, 1880 to, through 1910. And as with the Second Empire, the reason we see so many of these homes is because this period of the late 1880s through 1910 was one of exponential growth in Montclair. Lots of homes are being built. So our great example this time is so Queen Annie that we were able to pluck it right from the streets of Montclair. We've got many angles, that's for sure. Um, asymmetry, applied detail, um, the porch. Uh, and I can't tell if that's a turret or a tower. Uh, there's a projecting upper floor, large one over one windows, it's got different patterns in its shingles. And on the far right, there seems to be a rounded bay window on the corner there and um, where the gable projects over it. And ding, 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 that's a classic Queen Anne detail. So we're not just looking at lots of angles and roof shapes and heights coming together, but tons of detailing, finials, spindle or columns, and areas of different patterns in shingle, stone, or brickwork. Basically anything but smooth. The angles on this house on South Fullerton Ave um, speak Queen Anne, and it, it's also got bay windows, the wraparound porch, asymmetry, turned posts, so they all, you know, speak to the Queen Anne design style. And this one on um, at 66 South Fullerton Ave, it had a major um, adaptive reuse redevelopment about 20 years ago, but you can still see the original house in there. Uh, this is called the Livermore House, actually. Uh, there's many angles, um, the bay, there's a porch, the tower, but it's even more obvious in the original. Um, you got that big wraparound porch. Uh, it still seems to have had the one over one windows at that, at that point. This house was designed in 1885 by Charles McKim of the McKim Mead and White firm. They were the architectural firm that designed the original Penn Station in New York City and the James A. Farley building across the street that has recently been repurposed to include Long Island Railroad. Uh, it, they also designed the Isaac Bell House in Newport, Rhode Island, which Jane will discuss later as one of our great examples. This yellow house is on Northview. It was built in 1900 and gives us all the angles, the bay windows, the projections. It was actually, uh, it's on the National Register and it was even featured in Scientific American, which noted that it was an inexpensive and well-built home. I'm sorry, I went the wrong direction. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, so here it is in Scientific American. Um, this is a beautiful home on Upper Mountain Avenue. Um, if you look at the second floor tower on the right, there's a small rectangular window above the main window. Again, that window detailing is um, a giveaway to the Queen Anne style, but it also has a lot of the other Queen Anne features. This home was designed by um, an architect whose last name was Dakuna, and he designed many homes in Montclair. The next two Queen Anne's are from Christopher Street and uh, many on that street are as beautifully restored as these are and they're, they're easy to spot. Um, by the way, this was an early um, Montclair housing development. So uh, Jane, if you could go back to the dark blue one, the, uh, here we see the porch details, which are very nice, both at the entry level and above on the sleeping porch. That was a, um, a porch on a second floor that would help you cool your house in, uh, in the hot summer nights. But so you see the turn posts, applied details, pa different pattern shingles and projecting facades. And this uh, the turquoise one has similar, um, you know, a mix of shingle patterns and other projections and angles. 
Here's a petite little Queen Anne on Chestnut Street near Forest. Now it's not as sprawling as the other Queen Anne's we've seen or what you might expect from a typical Queen Anne, but it was um, designed for a more modest lot size that you see in that area. And our astute colleague, Betsy Cecchio noticed um, this telltale sign on the side of the house to, that indicates it's a Queen Anne. Um, you see this large window pane surrounded by small squares of, um, of glass and they actually you can't tell from this picture but the little squares are colored glass um, that is a, a very telltale sign of Queen Anne design and we wrap up Queen Anne with one that is nearly as quintessential as the first one we showed it's got all those angles um, the great porch tower it's got window details including um, the little rectangular pane above the main window pane and um, so, but now let's imagine this Queen Anne, if it put on a pair of Spanx and all those angles were just smoothed over. Okay, maybe not Spanx, Helen, but uh, definitely far more restrained than Queen Anne or Stick. Um, this is the Isaac Bell House in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, it was built by McKim, Mead and White, um, famous architectural firm and quintessentially shingle. It's found today mostly in coastal New England, but you still find um, some located nearby. It was considered very high, high style and it never really took on uh, the same popularity that Queen Anne did. According to the field guide, the shingle style, quote, aims for the effect of a complex, complex shape enclosed within a smooth surface, the shingle exterior that unifies the irregular outline of the house. So let's look at some of the features. We have obviously wooden shingles and that's not just on the side, that's on the roof as well. We have irregular roof lines. We have cross gables, meaning that you may have one that faces the front and one that faces the side. Um, you would have very broad continuous roof lines often sweeping over the porch. The windows were often in pairs or triplets. The porches, and boy, this house has at least three we can count and we didn't even see the other side in the back. Uh, the tower is not always a sign of it, but it uh, was in about a third of the shingle style homes. It's asymmetrical and it has this heavy stone foundation. Now, I suspect that what might have been some of the shingle style houses in Montclair have been covered over with different materials um, on the roof or on the sides or painted. So sometimes the simplicity is not so obvious, uh, but any way you look at it, we've come a long way from those early federal styles. Look at this beautiful one on Grove. Um, wooden shingles, um, check. Cross gable, check. Porch, check. Uh, paired and triple windows, check, check, check. Stone foundation, check. Asymmetrical, check. And then we have this one, um, this is over on Pleasant Avenue, a little harder to see, but imagine it with unpainted wood shingles and an, a wood shingled roof. It's the former eight acre Rosebray estate on Pleasant Avenue, built in 1888 and renovated in 1905 by Dudley Van Antwerp. It's the right time period and it's got several of the hallmarks. It has that cross gable, um, it has strips of windows. Uh, it has eaves on different levels. It has a porch. And of course it has that roof line that sweeps down over the porch. And this is the Clark House, which is uh, the Montclair History Center's administrative offices and library. And if I were actually in the office, this is where you'd find me. Um, it was built in 1896. And this is what it looked like around 1930. I think it's a combination of shingle and Queen Anne. Um, you've got the wood shingles, you've got the irregular roof line, there is the tower, there is that broad sweeping roof line across the porch and there is a heavy stone foundation. And then there's this one on Llewellyn built by Montrose Morris in 1892. Notice the multi-levels, the towers, the banked windows, the porch. And then this one on Claire Will Avenue, look at the turrets and the sweeping roof line over the porch that goes down almost like a ski slope. Um, and over, so you can see it right here, almost like a ski slope down and over that porch, a telltale sign of a shingle style roof. 
And finally, um, this one on South Mountain, which is kind of, I find that the paint job is a little distracting here to see what it really is. Uh, but if we make it black and white, it's a bit easier to see. Notice the asymmetry, that sweeping roof line, the porch. So I think this could have been shingle in its day. So just to talk about everything we've discussed today, we have the shingle style uh, with those beautiful sweeping roof lines. We have the fancy Queen Anne style home that is basically the kitchen sink home as I like to think of it. We have the stick style home with all of those applied details. We have the second empire with its mansard roof. The Italianate with its rounded windows, although this one doesn't have it. We've got two Gothic style homes. We've got the Carpenter Gothic and the Gothic Revival. We have the limited number of Greek Revival houses in the area, as well as even fewer federal style homes. And then finally, we have a host of Dutch and English vernaculars, which are as a whole program unto itself. Now, we asked several people if they wanted to send in pictures of their homes to see if we could help identify them. And this is one that we got um, from somebody who lives on Inwood Avenue. And I am going to invite anybody who would like to open your mic and just tell us what you think it is and why you think it is. You can't just say, oh, it's A. You have to say, I think it's A because it has such and such. All right, go. Queen Anne, Sarah, what makes you think it's a Queen Anne? Asymmetry. Asymm asymmetry, right, yes, definitely asymmetrical. Any other thoughts? A bit of a tower. Right, right, that would be a, well, I can't tell, does that go down below? Could be a tower or a turret, yep, absolutely. We've got some other guesses also. Um, so in the chat room, uh, let's see, uh, hybrid between Queen Anne and Shingle. Uh, someone wants to see the summary page again. It, was that the last one, Jane? You want to show that again? Sure. Um, so it's got the curved bay reinforcing the Queen Anne. So between Queen Anne and Shingle. And the porch. And the porch. Right. I, and you can see, I agree, John, you can see that it sweeps down over there. So that sort of has the shingle look to it as well. That, that's what Jane and I were thinking, that it was a sort of a combo. Yep. Which is so typical in Montclair. You yeah. always have the combo. It's, it's very rare that we find a pure style of anything. So, yeah. And I think the Queen Anne um, name is just more... Um, well known than than shingle but Jane did we have another example Beth thinks it is a shingle um, Beth do you want to type in the chat room why you think it's shingle over Queen Anne I guess I guess I was thinking of shingle because it has a the tower and the sloping roof on the on the top there it has the porch um, it's, it's hard to tell whether or not it had a Stone, um, if it has a stone, at some right? Point. But yep. it could be, it has sort of both Queen Anne and Shingle, but to me, it just sort of has jumped out more of Shingle when I first my first impressions. That's why I wrote that. Cool, okay. Here's another one. Hi, um, I was curious with a number of these uh Queen Anne type homes, there's a fireplace sometimes. Was that a subsequent addition or would they have been built the fireplaces with the original house? The fireplaces were probably, by the time a lot of these houses were built, there was central heating, but depending on the age of the home, it might have also been used for heating the house itself. Usually though, Queen Anne is, is, is beyond the time when you really need the fireplaces just for heat. No, I lived in the Queen Anne for many years. And uh, had ten fireplaces, many fireplaces. Many fireplaces. Yeah, I think they, they you know, they're just. I think Jane, your point may have been that it wasn't um, the only heating source. And, and I think it would depend on when really it happened. I mean, an earlier Queen Anne might have been more reliant on fireplaces, but an older Queen Anne, there was probably coal heat at that point. And. In the 60s, it was still pretty cold in that house. 
Yeah. Um, someone in the chat, um, just I'll just ask answer the quick question about the Howe House. The house was for rent, as we believe, um, not for sale. Um, and um, then just getting to the picture on the screen now, um, again, John thinks it's Queen Anne with Greek revival details, basically Montclair eclectic. And you're you're probably right there, John. Notice that that front porch uh, entrance definitely looks Greek revival. Today. Yeah, those are those are actually Doric Doric columns. I'm an architect, so I I maybe have an unfair advantage. That's okay. I understand you were at the <laughs> office yesterday as well. Yes, I did. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your hospitality. There it was very very helpful. Good. I appreciate it. Good. Looking well, and we've seen you. we've seen architects thumb wrestle over these distinctions, so we're happy to have your your sure. input. And um, like we said, you know, sometimes uh, you know it's such a mishmash that that people can't decide on a definitive um, you know style. But I think that uh, I that was wondering if I might ask you both a question, which um, which has crossed my mind. Uh, when when I looked at your chart organizing all of the different styles, I noticed you didn't list arts and crafts as a style. Is that um, because it wasn't prevalent? Because I think I've seen arts and crafts homes in Montclair, let's say that were modeled on the arts and crafts movement in England, which I guess was from around 1890 to around 1910 the early uh, teens that's and, that's really next week we'll be talking ah, about, okay. we kind of lumped it into into the 20th century as got opposed you. to these so yeah we've got them um, okay can anything be done to save what's left of the mid-century homes i'm not sure what that refers to that was in the same um comment as the how house kim mclaren would you want to clarify hi i just have noticed that there are homes being taken down to, you know, like a stick and then new modern homes being put up? I, this is just total speculation here. I think that mid-century has not, has a lot of mid-century homes, there are the classic ones, there are the vernacular mid-century homes and they're the ones that are really cool mid-century modern homes. And I think that, um, you know, people are just getting around to realizing the value of saving those style homes as opposed to, um, you know, modifying them so grossly that you can't tell what they are anymore and or tearing them down. Usually it takes about 100 years before a house actually gets to be recognized as old. And we're just nearing that cusp, I would say now. Um, a few more comments. Um, can we talk about houses built in the early 1900s? Uh, we will be talking in part two of this about home more styles um, into the 1900s and, and houses specifically as two families. I don't know that currently we focus on that. Maybe before we meet again, we can, um, you know, look at introducing some specific research on that. Um, let's see. Carol Selman had many comments in the chat room. Thank you for your additional um, comments, Carol. Many of these homes are on the National Register. Uh, uh, yeah, there's many more homes in Montclair that are on the National Register as well. We, Jane and I also talked about doing a whole separate show about homes in Montclair that are on the National Register. Uh, we could we could go on all day about architecture of Montclair, and I think that many of you would be interested as interested as we are. So you know we expect there you know there will be additional programs, um, and uh, yeah. Th so I think Carol's point is talking about different levels of protection, uh, whether it's local, state, or federal uh, register. And if we can, at the end of next week, we can talk a little bit more about that for you. So um, we'll see how quickly we can get through the 20th century uh, next week. So uh, guys, it's after one, so we're going to wrap yeah. this up. We hope you join us in two weeks to see part two of this presentation. If you have um, a home you'd like us to cover uh, at the end, the way we did today, send it to either Helen or me. Um, you can find uh, on our uh, MontclairHistory.org, our website. Just look for this program and there's a link to the, our emails directly. So you can do that. So Wait, Jane, last thing, is, the, is there a link to our YouTube channel from our website? Yes. Okay, yeah. so yeah, you can go to our website, montclairhistory.org and click the link to our YouTube channel or you can go to YouTube and search for Montclair History Center. That, the YouTube that question channel on our website, the YouTube channel on our website, actually there's a, um, um, a line that says quick links and it's got a whole bunch of different links in there and one of them is uh, the link to the YouTube channel. Okay.
Everybody, thank you all for coming.